be. Oh, everyone's muted now. Well, so um, as people are arriving, let's <laughs> let's give everyone another minute or so. Mm -hmm. And while people are arriving, I'm going to give a quick reminder of the fact that this was a uh, a new program conceived, you know, talking about benefits of um, talking yeah. about benefits mm -hmm. of um, uh, of the pandemic and all of us being on Zoom. Of all the things that were challenging, this is one of the beautiful things that came out of it. <laughs> um, we were in the in the Shabbat breakout room, and uh, I think it was Melissa who turned around to Rita and said, "What have you been working on?" And Rita grabbed the painting and started showing it, and the whole group in, in, became involved in the conversation. And, and we said, "Wow, that's a that's a program. If there ever was an idea for one." <laughs> and so. Uh, this beautiful idea of TE folks, our artists and creators sharing a little bit of their art, talking about their process and what it is that they do. And it's been absolutely fascinating. We had a lot of fun with the first three programs. And then the fourth one was going to be Howard sharing about his photography and Joan sharing her pottery with us. And then a storm uh, interrupted all of our internet supply. <laughs> and so we had to... So for some of us, this is still August. Um, but in reality, <laughs> it is now October. And we are re ready to resume our regular scheduling. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn to Howard Siegel to take the first part of this presentation. And thank you all for being here. So exciting. And um, we are, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are streaming on YouTube. And so that means that the recording of this will also be available because some of our members uh, had other obligations tonight, but we're very excited to hear and to see. So go ahead. Okay. I'll try not to bore you uh, by talking about F-stops and ISOs and a whole list of other alphanumeric uh, items. If anyone is interested in it, I'll be glad to do it at another time. I'd like to start with my uh, evolution as a photographer. This was my first camera. It was a brownie bullet. It came from my grandfather and did not work at the time. I had a lot of fun pretending to take pictures. I must have been about four or five at the time. My first working camera was a Brownie Hawkeye I received in high school. I went through a lot of flash bulbs and film, took pictures of various school events, mostly, mostly setups as the camera did not have a fast shutter speed. Next was a Polaroid swinger since I could not have access to a dark room while in uh, the service. I had two photographic uh, disasters in 1970, which was my last year of service. On the home front, my brother wanted my room, so my stuff was boxed and moved to the basement. Basement flooded. All my prints and negatives were ruined. The second disaster was a barracks fire. Lost the camera and all the uh, pictures. This picture was taken off the, uh, off the internet. This is a Kodak 620. It's part of my collection of older cameras. If you have any old cameras hanging around that you don't want, I'll be glad to relieve you of the uh, burden of dusting them. My first modern SLR, single lens reflex, which means that through a mirror, you look through the lens, is part of a, it was a Canon Rebel. It's a film camera, and so has now been uh, relegated to my collection. I got this for uh, where big cameras just were not appropriate. My first digital SLR was a Canon Rebel. I liked them because they were lighter than the competition. Next, I moved up to the Canon 40D. It was faster and had a higher ISO. Sorry, I 
No, I said I wasn't going to talk about the alphabet. Now I use a Canon M50. It's, it's a mirrorless camera and considerably lighter than any of my previous SLRs. When you're hanging a long lens off a camera, weight determines how long you can hold it steady, waiting to take that perfect picture. Now on to the pictures I take. Sometimes every now and then I get myself out at the right time to capture something like this. Now, I also like to take people, pictures of people in costumes. I'll also take pictures of flowers. Uh, my problem with taking pictures of flowers is the fact that I don't have the patience to wait for the breeze to die down. And uh, when, when the, if, there, if there's any breeze, your pictures are going to come out blurry if, uh, if, the, if they're moving. Every summer, I, except for this past one, I attend a three-day seminar on photography. There are lectures on lighting, setups, and how-to. They also show some of the latest equipment and let you try it out. There are setups of tabletop and models. That's not what's supposed to be there. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Uh, okay, it's gonna, it's not gonna work out the way I wanted. Sort of like life, right? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Let's see where the models are. Okay, I was talking about the uh, uh, the summer. I go to the seminar. They have they have live models there that I can that you can take pictures of. And yes, I do gravitate to the women. Mother and daughter combo. Now these next three were into, were accepted into international competition. I'll always stop to uh, take a picture of a bride. This one and the next one were taken on the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. I was just walking across it going to uh, uh, what's called Dumbo, uh, down under the Manhattan Bridge. I also like trick photography. Uh, in this case, I set it up and I'm photographing uh, water drops. Wow. You know, you saw this already. As I said, I like to take pic uh, pictures of people in costume. And there's the flowers again. Now, my favorite thing to take pictures of is lighthouses. They don't move, and you can take all the time in the world to uh, take the picture. This is Ledge out in uh, New London.
Uh, this one is Bass Harbor up in Maine. And I had to get at least one selfie in. This is up in uh, Tarrytown, uh, Sleepy Hollow, home of Ichabod Crane, the Headless Horseman. And I go, I go for pictures, I also go to different shows. In this particular case, it was the car show. And air shows, powwows. I go to museums, and this is the tro uh, trolley museum. And I like to take pictures of waterfalls. And I do some trick photography. Like, in other words, I take the picture and then I manipulate it in the uh, computer. That's all, folks. Thank you so much, Howard. I think we need we needed to ask you to go a little slower on some of those pictures so that oh. we, uh, we got we got to see it. You, were, it, that's that was uh, an amazing selection. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. Any questions for for Howard? Um, yeah, I have a question, Howard. Sure. When you work, do you do you edit it while you're in the camera, or do you do like edit photo editing and saturating and there, tweaking the, photos there, later? There, there is a pro. There are there are some. You can uh, edit it in camera. I don't. Uh, even though it throws me on the on the camera screen, what I have. I don't trust it that much, so I prefer to get it into the computer before I do any editing. Uh, the brightness and such will differ uh, on screen, camera screen, as opposed to your uh, monitor screen. And there are programs for uh, adjusting your computer screen to the correct uh, colors. Uh, that's one of the things that I have to do on a uh, monthly basis because my, uh, I enter my, my pictures into competition. Uh, I belong to the Milford Camera Club and they adjust their display. So I have to, uh, have my display be the same as theirs so i get i get a get a uh good result hmm. howard i know you promised not to to say numbers but since um some of the newer cameras that you've been talking about starting with the with the film rebel and moving on to the rebel uh, mine was an xti it, it felt like you were going through the cameras that I have been using uh, <laughs> and have, and now I, I, I'm on 60D. I have, I have been looking at the M's. I, I haven't fully, uh, fully committed to the, to the I'll jump. You, what kind of lenses do you use? What, um, what, what oh, I, I in other words, the reason I, I stuck with can with Canon is because of my, I could get an adapter to mm -hmm. use my, uh, my Canon uh, lenses. So I've got a, uh, an 18 to uh, 50, 55, mm -hmm. and I've got a 50 to 300. Okay. Now, you probably noticed that there were no pictures of birds. Uh, you need a long lens for birds, and you need a lot of patience. And patience is not one of my virtues. <laughs> And tying in with patience, do you usually shoot manual settings or or do you or, or automatic? Uh, I do both. Uh, it depends on what I'm doing. In other words, if it's where I have got to be ready at a moment's notice to take the picture, I have it on automatic. 
if uh, if it's a setup like when I was doing uh, uh, lighthouses or waterfalls, that's going to be in uh, in manual because I'm going to want uh, a longer time frame to take the picture, and uh, therefore I have to play with the f stop and the time and all that. I hope Howard. that answered your question. Yes, it did. <laughs> Howard, how much traveling do you do, uh, forgetting about this year, but how much traveling do you do specifically to take pictures? Uh, um, well, even now, I'm, I'm out most weekends uh, hiking and uh, taking pictures. Uh, going, there, there's about 30 water, I think, I think the number's 30, 30 uh, waterfalls here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going out to take pictures of them. Uh, there's a lot. Of, I was surprised when I looked at how many hiking trails there are in Connecticut. And so I, I go out to the hiking trails and mm -hmm. uh, I take pictures of the. Uh, mm -hmm. cover. And I want to unmute it. Now, now you can talk. OK, just wait till we just. Mm -hmm. uh, I take pictures of like wooden bridges and things of that nature. So I'm going up to Northern uh, Connecticut where, uh, where they are. Mm -hmm. Do you plan trips though around, around uh, taking particular photos, like going out West to the um, national parks and have you uh, done no. anything like that? No. <laughs> no. Uh, that's not, well, I'd like to do it. Uh, that's not been my, uh, my thing to do. Well, your photos are quite beautiful. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yep. Howard, I want to ask, uh, earlier, were you doing mostly black and white, especially when you were doing your own developing? Yes. Uh, color photography is uh, much, much more uh, color sensitive or t temperature sensitive. And I never had a place where I could actually set that kind of a control. Howard, um, Alan and I were saying how, what a good eye you have. Yeah, your, yeah. your photos were really beautiful and- mm -hmm. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, I was especially up. jealous of some of those waterfall shots. Uh, <laughs> I love taking pictures of water and uh, uh, you were moving way too quickly through them, but there was a few shots in there that was uh, hard to catch something like that. Yeah. It's there's a there's a certain amount of training that goes in. Uh, before I joined the uh, camera club, uh, my pictures would were not that uh, that good. You know that good as far as like waterfalls are concerned. Uh, you have to learn about uh, to get the like the fr the frothy. Uh, well, it it's called the fairy mist by other camera enthusiasts. Uh, you have to have, you have to have a longer time frame to take your picture, and uh, so therefore you have to play with the f stop and the uh, time. No. Okay. Uh, okay. That's Len and, and Meryl, you guys want to ask a question? Yeah. Some. Any more questions? Yeah, do you have a, do you have a shoot with, with film anymore or everything is digital? No, it's all digital now. I don't, I, as a matter of fact, I don't think anybody in our club is uh, shooting uh, film anymore. And, and you, what, what do you know how much it costs to roll, to develop a roll of film? Mm -hmm. I, and you can't I remember get it, from the old days. No, no, I'm talking about today. Oh no, what does it cost now? You're talking $30, $40 for a roll, a 20 exposure roll. Wow. And where do you even get it developed? Uh, there, there are places you have to send it out to. Uh, the only reason I happen to know about it is that one of my fellow workers, uh, he found that his mother passed away last year and he found a couple of cameras that she had. It still had film in it. One was a uh, 
a disc. A, you, anybody remember the disc camera? Mm -hmm. Well, one was a disc camera, and the other, and the other one had, uh, had was two had two rolls of uh, thirty five millimeter film, twenty exposure. Now, for the disc camera, he had to actually send it to Minnesota, and they brought it over the uh, a border to Canada for it to be developed. I lost the picture of me. Anytime I tried to speak, it didn't work, so I give up. I'm just gonna. And for the uh, 35 mil uh, millimeter rolls. Uh, he had sent, he sent it to Texas. Thanks. I'm good, right? So, I mean, and the disc camera, the disc film was $40, and the uh, each roll of uh, 35 millimeter was $30. Um, what you, what are you wearing? Carol, I, I think you were trying to ask a question, but uh, you, you seem to be muted when you are asking and unmuted when you guys are talking with Lenny. So... Uh, let me, so you're muted right now. So you need to unmute. unmute. Your... I'm unmute, right? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yes. I just wanted to know, well, your pictures are, your photographs are lovely. Is there a particular season that you like, especially, or a particular time of the day that you prefer to take your photos? Uh, for photos, you normally want either early in the morning or in the late afternoon, evening. Okay. Uh, the reason being is has to do with shadows right. when they're outside. So Great. that's okay. the time I normally try. When, if, if you saw the first picture, the one with the uh, sunrise. Yes. Yeah, that was around six in the morning. Okay, that was lovely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What, what do you use to edit? Which, which program do you use? Photoshop or? Photoshop Elements. Uh, it, the Photoshop Elements, it's, a, it's an $80 program, and you, uh, how should I put it? It does 90% of what Photoshop, and I just couldn't see spending $400 on the program. Mm -hmm. Just remember, I'm an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> I spend my money on the equipment, not the software. Howard? Yes. Do you always use available light or do you adjust lighting, for instance, when you are taking the photos of the models? Uh, there, it's being, it's being, uh, I'll use a reflector, things like that, if that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I'll also use fill flash because if like, if they're wearing a hat or something like that, mm -hmm. it'll cast a shadow over their face. So you want, you want, either a reflector down at their feet if you're not going to take a full body shot or you'll or you try to put some light off to the side do you bring reflectors and equipment like that with you when you go off on a shoot yeah yes plus the fact uh when i go up to the summer seminar they they're it's generally available there mm -hmm. And they also set up the lighting. In other words, I have to adjust the lighting, but uh, the uh, the lighting is already there, so I don't have to bring it with me. Is a black backdrop ever used? I'm do sorry, they, what kind of? What do kind of they backdrop? ever use black instead of something that reflects? Do you have things that absorb the light? Well, yeah, we use black. Uh, we use. We also use uh, white uh, as uh, it's called high key. Uh, I mean, right now in my basement, I've got a uh, blue cloud uh, backdrop set up. Mm -hmm. When would you use that? Depend uh, if I had a uh, bathing suit model or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Howard, thank you so much. I think we are going to uh, to thank Howard. And uh, if any additional questions come up, we'll uh, we'll get back to them uh, later on. With your permission, this was fantastic. Um, and thank you for sharing. I I now realize why um, 
why I want to, I should have had control because I would have slowed down some of those pictures to see to see them properly. <laughs> they were beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Howard, for sharing. And we are now moving to our second presentation to Joan. And so I will be. You see, I, that's why I'm going to have control here. No, that's that's not. Really, <laughs> that's really not it. But um, to make life a little e easier for Joan, uh, she had put together the presentation. I just get to uh, click the button and share it with you. So, uh, Joan Klager, without further ado, take it away. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I've been doing pottery for decades, and I was first inspired by a very dear friend of mine who uh, took an adult ed class, and she brought home these wonderful plaques, uh, small tiles of uh, the sun, the moon, some stars. And I thought, wow, she's, you know, she's able to make such wonderful things with just this little, um, you know, non-professional setting of the uh, adult ed class. So uh, when I had time a, a couple of years later, um, I signed up for um, a class uh, we were living in Virginia at the time, uh, metropolitan DC, and we're very, I was very lucky to have a, a wonderful um, parks and rec department uh, available and a very good teacher. And I first learned how to um, hand build uh, with clay and then throw on the wheel. So, um, Let's see. Uh, Say next slide. Yeah, Alan's telling me that I should prompt you, uh, Rabbi, to to do the next slide as needed. Okay. Well, anyway, that's a an example of uh, wheel throwing, which is what I do most of the time. Um, but initially, next slide. When you start out as a a beginner, as I did. Um, hand building was the first uh, exposure to clay. And this is an example of just a slab of uh, clay. Actually, this is porcelain uh, clay that um, I just threw uh, and rolled and left the irregular edges and then used it as a uh, vehicle for uh, the glaze. Um, next. And that's uh, another piece of porcelain uh, slab that um, I used uh, textures that I impressed on it. And uh, when you put texture into, into a clay surface, the glaze is picked up uh, in different ways and the crevices uh, hold onto more of the clay. So it's a different, uh, a different uh, coloration that, that you get. Next. And this is also an example, another example of porcelain slab that I impressed uh, a textured item onto. Next. The same, same idea, also porcelain with texture. Next. And this is a, a piece of stoneware clay, which is um, has more iron in it than porcelain. Um, porcelain does not have any iron in it at all, uh, hence the white color. Um, stoneware, which is what I use most of the time, uh, has a lot more iron and uh, darker minerals in it. Uh, so it picks up the glaze colors differently. Uh, next. Uh, this is an example also of a, a slab of clay that was molded or, or uh, placed over a, a hump uh, so that it, it has some dimension. And it's made uh, with three different kinds of clay. One is white stoneware, one is uh, brown stoneware, and the other is um, porcelain, I think. Okay, and then the, it just has one glaze on it, but 
the clay picked up the glaze uh, in different ways based on the, the color of the clay itself. Uh, next. Uh, this is unglazed uh, terracotta. Um, I threw it on the wheel and um, I chose not to glaze it because uh, it remains more porous uh, and I wanted to use it as uh, pottery uh, plant for plants. Uh, and I wanted that the ability for the water to be um, um, absorbed through the clay walls and uh, evaporate. Uh, poor, um, terracotta is a clay that is what is called low fire. Um, it has uh, more impurities in it or more um, iron and will melt at a lower temperature than a high fire clay. Uh, porcelain is normally high fired and so is stoneware. Uh, but even terracotta, which is called low fire clay, that is still fired at something like 18 or 1900 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's not, you can't just put a piece of clay in your oven at a high temperature, uh, it, it won't mature. Um, so that's, uh, that's what the pro one of the properties of low fire clay of, of earthenware. Um, also, I, I might add that uh, terracotta is, you know, has been used around the world for centuries and um, it means um, baked earth, terra earth and kata uh, cooked or, or uh, baked. Um, next, please. This is glazed terracotta that I, I made. And um, actually the lower fire clays uh, have more um, ability to uh, maintain their color. Um, the really high fired pieces, uh, or at least in the studio that I work at, uh, don't have as vivid a color palette as the lower fire clays like the terracotta. And there's also um, a white earthenware. So, um, so you often see uh, more vivid colors and brighter colors in around the world in um, various countries like, um, you know, Spain and Portugal and uh, France, et cetera. Uh, next. Okay, that's a, also that um, I, I did that and that I was trying to um, uh, give an example or, or really sort of copy what some of the Italian uh, or French potters uh, do. I mean, they have that a style that I was hoping to um, um, achieve uh, like with lemons on the edge and uh, some decorative elements. Um, but lower fire, this is low fire, this is terracotta, uh, does not hold up quite as well for functional purposes. And like, I wouldn't want to put this in the dishwasher, I, whereas the high fire stoneware and porcelain clays have more durability and they can go through the, the dishwasher and um, be put into the microwave with more certainty. Next, please. This is low fire. This is um, a clay that was fired in a pit. It's called pit fired clay and you get this smoky um, effect uh, depending on what uh, minerals you might put on it before the firing and also what uh, materials um, the, the clay is exposed to during the firing. Um, uh, so you can put in all sorts of things, sawdust or um, copper pieces, and uh, you, you come out with different um, effects. 
Next. This is a piece of stoneware that has not, that was only fired once. In, in pottery, um, after you form a piece, um, you, you fire it. And that first firing is called a bisque or biscuit firing. And that temperature in, goes, is um, about 1800 degrees. Um, and it's a porous, this piece of stoneware, this high fire stoneware is porous because it has not been fired at a mature temperature yet. Um, it's not, uh, not just the glaze, but the final temperature that you would fire a piece of clay at. Um, for stoneware, the maturity is roughly 22, 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. So even if you don't glaze it, that mature temperature of like 2300 degrees will vitrify the clay so that it is no longer porous. Next. Um, and this is a, you know, just an, oh, it's an example. I think I was showing this picture because I wanted to uh, point out that there are many different uh, ways to glaze a piece of pottery, to glaze that bisque ware. Um, and this was made by um, pouring a different uh, glazes um, over each other. Uh, next. As was this, this is um, also high fire stoneware with um, a pattern of different glazes that I put on the base Temo Ku glaze. Next. Um, now the per piece on the left is porcelain. The piece on the right is stoneware. And um, they both pick up glaze colors in different ways. And um, it's often, um, a mystery as to how the pieces will come out uh, of the final fire, the glaze firing. And so it's, um, there's some excitement, should I say, when the kill is opened after it's been second glaze fired, second fired or glaze fired to see how the pieces come out. Um, by the way, I have been doing pottery for a number of years at Creative Arts Workshop, which is located in downtown New Haven. And it's, a, it's an art school for those, <clears throat> those who might not know it, that um, have, the, the school has a number of classes in many different media, uh, drawing, uh, painting, metalwork, um, all sorts of different things. And I'm lucky enough to have the pottery studio at my disposal. I had been a student for a number of years and then I became a studio potter, which um, allows me to use the studio when I want to, but also in return, I, I along with 14 other studio potters, um, we, we load the, the kills, we fire them, we mix glazes, um, we keep the studio orderly, we um, monitor practice sessions. Um, next. Now this is a set of uh, bowls that I made that did not come out as I had anticipated they would. This glaze did not turn an orangey rusty color. They, the bowls uh, stayed whitish. It was very disappointing, but sometimes you have to adjust your expectations and say, you know, sometimes by the time I bring my things home uh, and let's say put it uh, in a, on a glass table, um, things sometimes look different and expectations can change. Next. 
Um, so this is just a, a sampling of decoration. Um, it's uh, glaze with um, iron oxide and another and a blue glaze to um, uh, give the, the bowls some interest. Next. And these also were wheel thrown. Most of my things are wheel thrown. I, I'm just more comfortable doing it. Um, and I like to leave the finger rings um, often in the, in the pieces. I, I like the way they look. It just says to me that, look, this is a handmade piece. You can see where the fingers were pressing into the clay. And then also they, it adds a texture that the glaze picks up. Next. And these are more examples of um, different glazes. Uh, some of these pots are made from, from um, porcelain clay and some from um, stoneware clay. Next. Same thing here, These, uh, the one on the right, the red one is a piece of porcelain. The red glaze um, really has a, a vibrant color that would not show up quite as vividly um, if, it were on, if it were on a piece of brown stoneware. Uh, the piece on the left um, is a dark glaze, which, uh, would actually look pretty similar on a, a porcelain as well as stoneware. It's a, a Japanese glaze called Temoku and it's been around for centuries. Next. And this is a, a texture that um, you can get by throwing on the wheel and then expanding the piece of clay so that you could get an oval shape. Um, and also those finger rings on the bottom um, do get picked up in a different way with the same glaze. Uh, next. Um, and these, <clears throat> sorry, these are um, uh, just high fires, the high fire stoneware with different glazes. I wanted to mention that um, when, when the clay is, mold, let's say, um, thrown on the wheel, uh, you, you have to wait until the clay dries enough, uh, let's say, what is called a leather hard state, uh, so that you can hold the clay and turn it upside down and trim the excess clay off the bottom where you have from where you've thrown it. So that after you trim it um, and you have to let it thoroughly dry, um, it has you can't rush it. Uh, so once it's thoroughly dry, uh, and this can take a few days, uh, you can then have it fired in the um, an electric kill, uh, so we call that a bisque firing, and um, I and I and that first firing goes up to about eighteen hundred degrees. I think I might have mentioned this. I don't know if I'm repeating myself. Then, when you take the piece out of the the electric kill, the bisque firing, you can then uh, dip your piece in a in a bucket of glaze. Um, that's how it's usually done because hand painting is not very effective, at least um, in this kind of um, a production of pottery. And then once it's glazed, then it goes gets loaded and fired in the uh, glaze kill. And in um, in my in the studio that I work at, the glaze kill is very large, you can step into it. It's, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 feet high, eight feet high. And um, 
maybe five feet wide and probably um, five feet deep. And at, at Creative Arts Workshop, we have, uh, we're lucky, we have three different glaze kills and uh, they're all for high firing and they're all gas fired. And um, I, I was, it's a little intimidating to fire those kills, at least when I was first learning, it was, it was very intimidating. And I, um, you know, I learned with other more experienced potters and now I'm the experience, one of the experienced potters and, uh, uh, you know, teach others how to do it. Um, and also those gla the glaze firings can, they start, we usually start them, um, let's say six o'clock, seven o'clock at night, then let the kill heat up overnight and then uh, one of us comes in in the morning and we spend the entire day until maybe five o'clock uh, doing gradual turn ups and adjustments with, of the gas and the air. And, um, and then when the, the, uh, the kill reaches the uh, desired temperature of about 2300 degrees, then we turn it off and it has to gradually cool down. And that takes two or three days, depending on which kill that we use. Uh, the bigger kill takes longer to cool down. So um, actually the making a piece of clay, making a, a piece of pottery from start to finish is, uh, it's a, it usually takes a couple of weeks, especially in a class setting, a studio setting. Next. Um, the, a piece that has a handle and a spout, uh, it takes a little more um, skill than just, a, let's say a bowl or a, a vase. Um, next. And when you, have a this kind of a spout, a handle, a, a lid, and a knob. To me, at least, this is the most um, challenging piece of clay to make. Um, it's, you know, it requires a lot of technical um, uh, piece pieces of of doing it as well as an aesthetic piece. Cause you know, you can put a handle and all these other things together but it may not look so great. You know, you have to hope that it's achieving something aesthetically pleasing. And so, you, you know, plus the glazing it's uh, you know a lot of different elements that need to be um, put together next. Uh, next. Or is that the end? I can't hear that, you. That is the that is the end. That's the last one. Okay. Um, uh, so so uh, before I open up the floor, um, I'm I'm going to ask. So, are these um, you know the spouts? Are these produced separately and then attached before yes. before the baking? Exactly. <clears throat> uh, that's why you know it's this whole process, and you have to do everything uh, so that, let's say I, so that everything dries together or doesn't dry out while you're waiting for the other pieces to be made. Mm -hmm. um, the spouts are wheel thrown and then sliced and attached. Um, the, the lid is also, you know, you have to measure it just so that it fits exactly into the uh, into the teapot and then you have to, you can either do the knob separately and add it to the lid or you can make it at the same time as one piece. And then there's the handle. Um, hmm. You know, it's, it's a lot to put together. So it seems. 
All right, well, at that, I'm going to end the presentation and uh, stop the share and allow people to ask the questions. This was uh, magnificent, uh, John. Oh, thank you. Go ahead, guys. Can I ask something? <laughs> First of all, Joan, it just magnificent. I had no idea what you did was so extensive. I really didn't. <laughs> um, but just a practical question. Can, sure. Do you have to fit just one, like one teapot in the kiln at the same time? Or can you do several? Well, the way it works in the studio that I'm at at Creative Arts Workshop is that my piece, I load my piece, but I also load, let's say 50 other pieces that belong to students in the classes or other studio potters. Actually 50 is a low number for the glaze kill. You, it's probably something like, you know, 150 pieces or 200, depending on the size. We have three different size kills. Um, and of course, in a, in a glaze firing, you cannot have any pot touch another. Uh, so you have to really be very careful about the way it's loaded and it, it takes a bit of time to do it. Um, and once you have put the glaze, done a glaze firing, can you ever re-glaze fire it? You can, but it it's, can be a little problematic because the glaze does not, not adhere easily to a glazed pot. Right. So, uh, but we, I've done it, other people have done it. It's just that it's not, uh, it's not so easy and you don't always, always get good results. I have two questions. Yes. Uh, one question is, uh, sometimes you see that the glazes crackle. Yes. How do you, uh, why does that happen? Well, that can be either an <coughs> accident, uh, which, you know, if a, a piece of pottery might be cooled off too quickly, uh, that's one possibility. And the other is that some glazes are specifically formulated to be, to have a crackle effect. Okay. The second question was, I could just see the amount of time forever you get through and now you have to load the kiln with everybody's things as well as your own and right. you stack it and tripod it. That's going to take an incredible amount of time yes, and not to have them stick together. Yeah, it does. It's, it's time consuming, but it's gratifying by the end. And uh, so there are 15 of us who are, who do this. Uh, I mean, who, <clears throat> who do the work of the studio. <clears throat> um, and I have to say, there's a great camaraderie that develops with these people that you work with so much and depend on and, um, and, and the students it's <clears throat> and the teachers, it's all a wonderful learning place and uh, friendship place. It's, uh, it's really great. I mean, what I've gotten out of it has been, has been very gratifying. <clears throat> Joan, um, I love your pieces. They're magnificent. I just yeah, had a question okay. on a given week. Yeah. About how much time do you actually spend in your studio? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually there uh, maybe two days a week. And, you know, if I were really, um, more dedicated, I would probably be spending three days, maybe even four, but um, I don't. But it's, it's always something that I feel is there calling to me. So. Superb work, it's so prolific. Oh, I know, yeah, I know. Sometimes you think, God, where did all of these pieces come from? I look back and I have a load, a load of them. <laughs> Yeah, yes, your please. pieces are beautiful. And I, I think in the beginning you had some uh, black porcelain and there were birds or pictures on it. Do you do you also draw and sketch and paint or? I'm not very good at it. Uh, you can, and it usually I think is easier to draw um, when the, before the piece is fired like when the piece of clay is still damp or leather hard. 
and then you have more control over the brushwork. Although you can do it in the other stages too. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. John? Oh. Yes. So I'm a proud owner of a whole bunch of your work from the Bolathon. <laughs> are you going to, are they having it again this year? Not that I'm aware of. Creative <laughs> Arts Workshop is totally closed. Yeah. The physical plant is closed. So I haven't been able to even do pottery since March 11th or whenever it was. Um, but um, so I, you know, there's no way we can have the Bolathon, which for other people, it's a fundraiser for the community soup kitchen in New Haven. Uh, we all make bowls, do donate them and people come um, and buy the bowls for, you know, the money that f for supporting the soup kitchen and also get a bowl of soup while they're there. <laughs> so. Joan? Yes. We've admired your work for a really long time. And oh, thank I, you. Still have, I still have pottery from friends in college. So this is a goofy question. Don't think bad of me for asking, but um, what kind of person can be a potter and what kind of person can't be a potter? Oh, that anybody can. Anybody can be a potter. If you just uh, want to work with clay, get your fingernails dirty. It's, it's available for everybody and anybody. So don't hesitate if, if you have any interest, try it. Try it. <laughs> I, I tried it. The few pieces I have, I'm embarrassed. I, tre I treasure them. You know I treasure them. <laughs> uh, listen, I know. I, I look back at some of my old pieces and I'm embarrassed about mine too. And then there are some pieces I look back and, on and I say, I did that? I don't even know how I did it. So, you know, you could surprise yourself. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Can I ask a question? Of course. When you paint the glaze on, does it look, um, before it's glazed, the color that it comes out of the kiln? No, it does not. So how do you That's know, not. how do you know what it will look like? Well, you know, let's say you want a, a blue piece, a blue glaze on your pot you go to the bucket of blue glaze. It has a label on it that says this is, you know, and we have more than one blue glaze or we have oh, probably 15 or 20 different glazes that we mix. Um, so you, you know what, uh, let's say, Temoku is going to look like. So if you want a shiny dark brown uh, glaze, you go to the Temoku bucket it says Temoku, you dip your piece in and you hope for the best. Sometimes it doesn't always come out the way you hope it will, but you know, you, you do have to, you have, there's a certain element of- um, You shut the door. A certain element of surprise or unpredictability. Joan? Yeah. They, they have a huge number of sample tiles though on, the wall at yes. Creative Arts. I usually count on you know those to yeah. guide me. But under glazes will look like the color. If you use under glazes on terracotta or on low fire clay, white clay, earthenware, yeah. then you can see the colors and they come out just you know you and know. Under, and lower fire right. glaze and lower low fire glazes are more predictable. Right. So you'll know more or less what the, they will look like. I just yeah. thought I'd chime in because I used to take care of all <laughs> the ceramic studio at Amity. Oh, I know. I know. Work with I the low fire glazes so the kids could basically see what they were going to get. That's right. That's right. I think that's it's more gratifying when you're yeah. a beginner to, to do you the want low control. Fire. Yes, exactly, exactly, Thanks. and oh. uh, and you also ran a soup bowlathon fundraiser, didn't you? Yeah, we did two of them. Yeah, yeah, we raised a lot of money, and I love the pieces that Creative Arts pot Studio Potters put out for us. I've bought huge platters and things as gifts 
for people. Yes. You know, yes. so we raise thousands worse. of dollars with that right. bolathon uh, every year now for the past several, we've been raising like eight and nine thousand dollars in just one day. So it's wow. remarkable for all for the soup kitchen. And the soups were donated, weren't they? Yes, yes. Or we made some. Oh, they were. We went to that um, bowl yes. of fun and we bought, I think, six bowls, like cereal or salad. Mm -hmm. And I tell Joan all the time we have breakfast with her every morning because <laughs> Thank you. they're I so wonderful. Good bad, but <laughs> that's good. That was good. Well, I have we to love say them. Thank you. And I, I love using pottery uh, made by people that I know, by friends. It's, it's very, um, there's a real connection there. Hello, Joan. Yes. Hi, Myra. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Now, I started collecting your pottery in the late 80s, early 90s by oh. being a volunteer at the Temple Emanuel Hanukkah Bazaar. Oh. And you always donated such beautiful things. So I own a number of those things. Thank you very much. And oh, we use you. it all the time. And your, your development of where you are today, your things are beautiful in the 80s and 90s, but you've gone above and beyond and you're oh. so modest. So I just want Thank to acknowledge you. that you have wonderful, wonderful talent. And we're very, I've never broken one of your pieces. They won't break. What are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> we just have to keep using them so much. I have a casserole dish that I used constantly wonderful. and different bowls that are beautiful. You probably wouldn't remember them, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing what you do. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. We have to leave, but I wanted to say, both of us wanted to say thank you for doing this. And oh. you too. Thank well, you so this, much. Well, this thank was, um, this was uh, our fourth meeting. And every time we set out and, uh, and we have this conversation, both with creators and, and I'm thinking, you know, at first, how are we going to fit all this stuff into an hour? Thank and you. then how on earth are we going to fill the hour with all of this? And uh, the two of you have, have taken us and suddenly my experience of this is the time begins to melt away and uh, and lo and behold it has been an hour thank you both so much mm -hmm. thank you everyone for showing up for having fabulous questions and uh, this is wow. not uh, this is not the end of the list of the creators and talented people at TE so if you are next on the list we don't we haven't scheduled any additional dates but if you if you are next uh, think about this. Reach out to Rita, um, uh, to me, who, and Rita, thank you so much for continuing to coordinate this. Um, we are, I think, I think this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, TE special, and we should definitely uh, schedule uh, a few more as this year continues to keep us, sadly for now, at home. But what a fabulous way to get to know each other a little more and to see this incredible creativity that resides right here in TE. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Joan. This was fabulous. Thank, Thank you, everyone, you. for being here.